Hey guys, it's Alexandra. Today I'm going to be talking with Terry. He is going to be sharing a near-death experience with me and talking about how it ignited his passion for going into graveyards and solving unsolved crimes, digging into murder mysteries. If you're interested in that kind of content, I will leave his channel below. Uh, we're going to be talking about censorship, shock value, all sorts of cool things. So I hope that you will stay tuned to check out the rest and you can subscribe for more videos. All right, thank you. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to do this interview. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thanks for reaching out. That's cool. I don't, I don't have people do that very often, so I'm usually the one asking other people. So it's cool to hear from you. Thank you for that. I got to ask you straight up. First of all, were you nervous about this interview? <laughs> um, not really. I'm more, more excited. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. That's cool. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, if you want, I'll let you start. Sure. Um, so I you know, after you had introduced yourself to me, I know we kind of got started talking about where this interview could lead and, you know, what kind of stories you have from life experience and things that you could share that would help people better understand your content and where it comes from. So if you kind of want to start from kind of your, your experience dealing with you know, very difficult situations. I know you you faced death a few times and you haven't had the easiest life. And I think it's really important when I meet people who don't have the easiest life to show how you can still use that hard, um, you know, those hard times to better yourself and find something you love out of all the hardships. So yeah. you kind of want to talk about how you got to creating and how you got to where you are now. I would love to hear more about that. All right. I am. Um, well, first of all, I was, I was middle child of three, um, mm -hmm. but my mom was married by her fifth marriage. I was abandoned by 14. She uh, signed the papers for my sister when she was 12 to get married in Alabama. It was the only state you could. So she actually drove her to Alabama and she got rid of my brother. My mom was not a very responsible parent. So she abandoned all her kids. So by 14, I was learning to do things on my own, mostly like working and uh, learn to take care of myself. Um, got married early on. Uh, I was burned. I had uh, I had a radiator cap pop off and burn me from my bottom lip all the way down my belly button. Then on the way to the hospital, somebody ran a stop sign and got in an accident. <laughs> so that was and it was the middle of the summer. It was like 80 or like 90 something degrees outside. And I was already burning. The guy was unconscious. I didn't even care. I ran as they were pulling him out and I went late on the stretch. I was like, I got to go. I'm burning. Um, just a bunch of stuff. I was told I had cancer. Um, and then before my first treatment, they said the cancer was gone. It was weird because I was a smoker for a long time. Uh, I smoked for 28 years cigarettes mm -hmm. and uh, I did quit. But uh, when they told me I had cancer, I started smoking menthol. I just didn't care anymore. I, you know, I figured, okay, I'm dying. And I went to my first treatment and they told me that in the x-rays, it showed there was nothing there. Um, they cleared up, so, and I was baffled. I've just had different, I was paralyzed. I had a, um, a virus called Gillian Bure. It mm -hmm. hit me on, I was married before, and it hit me on my wedding anniversary, mm -hmm. and uh, left me paralyzed, and I originally thought it was a spider bite. I argued with the doctors. I was, my body was tingling one day and stuff, and I started losing feeling. I'd argued, and I told them it was a spider bite and they kept saying no we believe it's something else well i left the hospital and the next day i couldn't get out of bed my brother who was a bodybuilder luckily was able to pick me up and uh got me to the hospital and i was in there for quite a while i want to say about three weeks before i was able to leave so, and then i had to learn how to talk everything i couldn't move my mouth when i talked uh, i talked through my teeth um so i i have been through a lot um i've had everybody close to me walk away my kids um, live with me and they didn't like my rules. Um, they had to go to school with me and stuff. So they chose their mom's way and they ended up not graduating and they got issues with weight and stuff now because they went their mom's way. So it seems like everybody that didn't want to work hard and do it my way. Um, I watched them fall, uh, or they didn't want to stick with me. Anybody that didn't want to grind hard for it. Um, they just want to come along and take what I had earned, they'd stick around. But if I showed them the way, they didn't want nothing to do with it. They didn't want to get away from me. Uh, kids, family, everybody. So I learned, you know, to do everything on my own, basically. And now you do a lot of content about, you know, um, crime solving and kind of darker content. So do you, do you think that that relates to what you've dealt with in your life at all? 
Yes, ma'am. Um, this, I don't know if you want me to say this, but I am satanic. I usually don't tell a lot of people just because it chases a lot of people away. But I picked up that book when I was 12 years old and it wasn't what I had thought. Um, it had rules in there, like basically respect people when you're, they're in their place. Um, if you don't respect them, don't go there. When people disrespect you, give them a warning, basically. And if they don't um, respect that warning, then you destroy them, whether it be verbally, physically, um, psychologically, you let into them. It was just rules that I went by and I realized it wasn't about worshiping anything. It was more about a code of conduct, a big one that I liked uh, and there was not hurting children. And I was always one, uh, even when I, when my kids were sick, I'd go down the bus stop. I'd be the only parent there to make sure the kids got on the bus. Uh, it was just the rules of Satanism that I liked and, and people were shocked. And I remember one time when I had cancer, they were looking at me, making sure I wasn't going crazy because I started seeing and hearing things. And they wanted to look into the satanic book to see if maybe they had something to do with it. And it didn't. But when I gave them the book, they had actually came back and told me, uh, the lady that went read it, she came back and told me it was nothing that she thought. She finished the book and it changed her whole way of thinking about Satanism. So I do credit a lot of that to um, Satanism, my success, um, because it's the only thing that taught me to get up and go. There wasn't a parent there. Um, not many friends, really. Uh, but that book told me over and over, get up and, you know, you are your own Jesus. <laughs> if you believe in Jesus, you know, you got somebody that's going to, you know, that took the punishment for you. But if you don't believe them, you realize you're going to pay for your mistakes. So that helped a lot. That did help push me. Um, so as far as the dark side, I've always been kind of dark. I was playing with the Ouija boards, young. Um, yeah, um, <laughs> just all kinds of stuff. Um, and then I started seeing and hearing things after I was told I had the cancer. Mm -hmm. And not so much ghost. Um, it would be like particles of, it looked like the size of dust, but particles of light floating away. And as I described them, they would tell me, it sounds like the people would like stare at each other and say, he's describing what you see a lot in hospice as people are dying. Mm -hmm. They don't know whether it's plasma energy that I'm seeing, but the way I describe it best is it's really tiny dots. And they look like they're just floating all around. Um, you can see most of the time like floating away from me. Mm -hmm. So the dark side's really never scared me. It's more interested in me than anything. I'm sorry if I can ramble on a lot. I do. <laughs> I do go. Right. You're fine. You're fine. I'm just interested in also the part of your content that, so it kind of, to me as a viewer, it seems like it all, and now especially knowing some of your backstory, it all kind of fits together. Like your whole energy meshes to it all makes sense the fact that you went through all this hard stuff and then you're gravitating toward you know more um more of the unknown you're really interested in that kind of stuff and and you know taking things to an uncomfortable level that maybe scared some people so i think yeah. um you know to have that sense of not being censored or filtered and kind of saying whatever you want and telling it like it is why is it important for you to have that kind of image well here's the thing um i, I usually don't use hard profanity when i'm around people that mm -hmm. shocking image that comes from a radio background i looked at my competition i was like okay what are they not doing they're not shocking people they're not being real uh you know people use profanity in reality i learned early on because I was abandoned. Um, somebody took me in, my best friend's um, dad took me in, you know, he let me stay there and he had taught me to respect women. And one of the things was he taught me was that's ignorance when you use profanity. So I, and when I'm with people, I don't use it a lot. It's that shock value. And when I started doing it originally with my channel, I was covering a case that really I got uh, emotional with. Um, I started, it was um, the burning question. And I started looking into one murder case. And by the time I was done, there was three. And uh, it involved a lot of racism and things that I didn't like. So I was really emotional. So I busted out with the F word right from the beginning from that video. And uh, people liked it. They're like, wow, this guy's real. He, you know, he don't care about profanity. So I used it for intro and it took off. But uh, it, as far as being the shock, um, using profanity, it is for shock value. Um, it's because I looked at what my competition was doing. They had covered all the graves, or most of the graves I had covered. Um, but they weren't doing, they weren't being real. They were worried about what they said and stuff. And you know, there is some words I just won't use. Uh, I won't use female uh, body parts. That's just something I've never used. Uh, I'm uncomfortable with it. And the biggest word I never, ever used, it was the only word as when my kids were growing up, 
was the M word. Um, I told my daughter, she, you know, all my daughters growing up, I didn't like the profanity, but that was the one word they never used in my house. So the shock value is most of the profanity. I don't use it a lot when I'm in person, especially with women, children, and uh, older people. Now, if there's guys around, sometimes I will, but the F word is just not something I use on a regular basis, actually. Do you think that using that has drawn more people to the kind of work that you do? Oh, no, man. In fact, uh, if I can warn you of anything, the reason why I won't use that or smoke on your channel is I may have 17,000 subscribers, but I probably lost that many as well because I've watched them subscribe and unsubscribe. And I know, and I see where it is. It's because they'll like the video. They'll like the, the content that I'm covering. They don't like the language. And they'll even tell me, you know, that language I can't. And we knew that going into this. We knew, okay, when you go on there's a lot of the viewers, most of my viewers are women. Uh, and a lot of them have children around. So, and they watch it during the daytime. So when they open it up and the F word is right there in the first 30 seconds, they're like, oh, then they're shutting it off and they're panicking. But we do that because we don't want those people that are watching children uh, to be watching our content. They need to be up watching their children. Um, my content is more for the people who are taking a lunch break and people who, you know, have free time to be doing it, not the people that are sitting there watching children. So we run them off right off from the front. Um, you know, if you're supposed to be watching children, that's why that's a big reason why we do that. Uh, we kind of pick and choose our viewers and we knew we were going to lose a lot. And like I said, I've probably lost 15, 1600 within the first three days that they did subscribe. So, it just comes with the, you know, the territory. When you want to go uncensored, you limit your audience. Right. And you never think about changing your own, um, you know, the way you run things to accommodate others. You think that you would stay true to yourself? Yeah. Um, for that reason, the biggest reason is because we don't want people um, watching, ki uh, watching kids. And that's mostly why people don't like the content. We've talked to people. And uh we they tell us no we just can't watch it because our kids are around exactly that's why we put that in the first 30 seconds because if you're watching your kids we don't want you watching our program right. we rather when you can watch and hear that content usually you don't have nothing else going on anyway so it's not an issue um that is the biggest reason we won't change i have limited it down um we're also looking at putting in some other shows we've added labels even um, but for the most part, no, we want to run the people off that are supposed to be watching children because that's usually the ones that have an issue with that profanity um, because there are children around. They can't sit around and listen to our show and watch the children. They're mad about it, but we're OK. We're OK with them being mad because we're getting them up to watch our children. Right. That makes sense. So, <laughs> so talk to me a little bit more about your radio background. I'm interested in how that um, how you still touch on that with what you do now. I um, started in radio, actually, uh, it was internet radio. It was long before Pandora and uh, iHeart. I did a station, I forget the, uh, who it was uh, through, but my station was actually Power Planet Radio. And I did a lot of comedy, a lot of profanity, um, interviews. On my, um, I do have pictures and stuff. It was actually back when MySpace was still big. That's how long yeah. ago it was. So yeah, it was, I got to meet a lot of comedians. Um, there was a show... Um, where they were doing a competitor with comedians. I got to meet all them. Uh, America's top comedian or something like that. I forget what it was. Uh, I got to meet Alonzo Bowden and I got to meet a lot of my idols as well. Megadeth. Uh, I got to meet Nick Men or speak to Nick Men's and not meet, speak to him via internet just before he passed. And he was my favorite drummer growing up. So I got to meet a lot of cool people doing radio. Uh, it gave me a little bit of this experience, but it's a whole different ball game. People don't understand. They're like, oh, yeah, you're used to it. I'm like, no, when you got that camera in front of you, they, people freeze. I, I got a big rig, and when I go out to events, um, I can turn my camera to people, and they'll be getting pictures. Their mom will be standing in front taking pictures, and I'll stand behind their mom with my camera, and you'll see them just freeze. It's, you, they act like they see a gun, and people don't understand. No, it's not the same as radio. It's a totally different ball game. totally different ball game when people can see you. <laughs> right. Yes, and when you... So when you go out, first of all, this is kind of a double question. My mm -hmm. first part would be, how do you come up with the stories that you're going to cover? And then the second one would be, what are when you go out to shoot something, what are you trying to find out? Like, what questions are you seeking to answer? 
when I go, well, first of all, to find them, I, I picked Denver for a reason. We will never run out of crime here. <laughs> never run out of crime in Denver. In fact, growing up, some of the cases I was most interested in are within one hour of here. You can look at Chris Watts, it's like 30 minutes. John Bonet Ramsey growing, you know, when I was younger, I was into that case. That's within 40 minutes. Just there's so many cases. I had three miles from the Batman shooting. Uh, I actually covered that already. Wow. Um and actually, there was another one just down the street that I just covered the other day, the Elijah McClain. I didn't realize that he was less than one mile from me where he was killed until I actually got to that case. I was like, wow, I literally walked to that thing uh, to show people the distance that he got to walk on his last walk. So there's just never, I'm never going to run out of crime, but I don't want to stick with crime forever. So I started looking to events. It was ironic that that car show happened at the graveyard because I got a good relationship with the cemeteries around here, you know, being out there so much. Mm -hmm. So they did a car show and I was like, okay, this is kind of a breakthrough because I tried the zoo, people weren't into it, my audience. And I tried um, Botanic Garden, people just weren't into it. So I'm trying to find stuff that people went and here comes Halloween right around. So we just locked in something for a haunted, a haunted field, an outdoor haunted event, the largest one in Colorado. So I'm really looking forward to that. That should draw some people in. And that's one of the things I'm trying to do is get more towards the events and not so much in the cemetery all the, all the time. Yeah, that makes sense. So have you been able to connect with people who respond positively to what you're doing? Oh, yeah. When I'm out there, uh, like events, uh, we give away stickers, T-shirts. People love free stuff. Yeah. When you give them free stuff, they're your best friend. Uh, and we've seen some come. We've even gotten a little criticism. And I read my uh, criticism. A lot of people delete it and stuff. I, You know, if something bothers somebody, if I agree with them, I'll make changes. If not, I'll leave it there so people can see. And if other people agree, they'll like it. Um, I won't run for my critics. Um, they help you out. But as far as uh, meeting people and stuff, people have always been cool when I've gone to the few events so far. They're really, they always want to get in front of the camera. I do some martial arts events. My daughter does martial arts, so I'm already cool with the school that I actually film all their events. And everybody wants to jump in front of that camera and ask them when they're going to be on video so they can see it. So people are really welcoming. And the YouTubers, the YouTubers are harder to get to work with. I was really happy that you worked me. I do want to say thank you once again for that. We had uh, two big names. I'm not going to drop their names, but both of them kind of burned me on it. So, and they were guys. So I'm like, look at the girls, not afraid at all. <laughs> the men are running. <laughs> so that was really cool. I appreciate you working with me on that. Yeah, cool. Yeah, no problem at all. I think it's, it is always interesting because you see, I've seen a lot of different kind of, um, mystery type of content on YouTube and kind of conspiracy type of stuff. What do you think makes your approach to it unique? Uh, I think it's because I've, I've seen death. Um, I, what uh, it's been described as, to me is as a uh, sixth sense. I can see things like a full picture where if somebody tells you a sentence, you'll see it one way, but I hear it and see it as a totally different way, um, as a warning, as a sign, as things to look out for. And I'm trying to think of an example in my mind's going blank, but I don't hear things like normal people. I don't see things like normal people, whereas uh, like taps, for instance, I could have a, you could be asking a question. My answer will be about to be yes, but I could hear a tap off in the distance or a dog bark and I'll get my answer from things like that. I pay attention to my surroundings more than I do my people. And I get a lot of my answers that way. Whereas people don't know, they do mislead. Um, but you can pay attention to your surroundings and I've paid attention and it's paid off for me every time. Um, that's how it's gotten me where I have. Uh, I didn't plan on coming to Colorado. We left with $400 in our pocket from Michigan and nowhere to go. Slept inside of a truck for the first couple of weeks. Um, and from there, I started out at 19 bucks an hour and then all the way up to 32. And as season rolls around, it gets up in the $60 an hour. And all you do, all I'm doing is delivering food during busy hours. Uh, I can do four hours a day and make more in one day than most people do in two days. Uh, and it's easy. And it gives me the ability to be able to work this channel when I want uh, to see my daughter. Uh, but I work for two different companies. And that's how I do it. You know, when one stops, I pick up on the other. So if my value drops anything below 32, I clock out. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's also interesting how you, so how you are very, you seem to have a personal interest in these stories. So do you feel that when you go out to these places, you're, you're gaining some type of 
closure almost from like what you've been through do you feel like it's changing it's changing your perspective on life at all a lot of times when i go out to these cases i don't know what i'm going to find i'm shown <laughs> things and i credit that to my gift like i said i don't see ghosts running around but i'll see signs that point me there's a guy right now that i just actually i have located two graves that do not want to be found there is no records of them but i located them through signs. Um, one of them is a guy who's trying to hide from history. He is, he burned a kid at the stake uh, who he falsely accused of raping his daughter. And it's down in history and it's trying to be, they're actually trying to have it erased from history. It was a Preston Porter case. And the father of the girl that was raped, um, his name was Robert Frost. Uh, his whole family is unmarked. And through finding his daughter, I ended up with one episode. By the time I was done, it was three. But with that gift, I found out where the father was, and this guy did not want to be found. Um, also, a porn star, uh, um, Linda Lovelace. She did not want her grave found. I was able to find her. It's, I just pick up on signs and things that point me to stuff. Um, I just call it a gift, and that's why I sum it up to. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you ever face people that... So when you, I, I would say everybody is going to have critics. So mm -hmm. when people come at you and say that you're fake or, you know, it's, it's what you're, if they're demeaning what you're doing, how do you respond to that sort of thing? I'm going to be honest with you. This is the first time I've ever talked about it with somebody that I wasn't there to change your life. The only people that really know about this gift that I have are the people that I've met after I developed this gift that I was kind of shown to go to, to change their lives. There was one girl who's, boyfriend committed suicide she was abandoned from the day she was born mm -hmm. and I told this girl things that she had to do in her life she changed her life she was told she would never have kids at the age of 37 when she made the changes in her life she had her first kid so uh it's so only people that know about this gift not only did I help them change their lives I showed them the gifts so that they were able to carry this gift on uh, it's not something that yeah I credit to when I got cancer I learned it but it's not something only I have. Everybody has it. It's the ability to pay attention to things around you. Tabs, signs, flashes, uh, listen to people. And then don't take what they say for granted, you know, just what they mean. Uh, listen to it and think of it. Open your mind that it could mean something else. And I'm really trying to think of an example. And I will send you one in an email so to give you a better idea when I come up with one. But it, when people say things, again, I don't see it like or hear it like they mean it. I'll hear it different and I'll pick up something off of it and be like, wow, okay. Uh, that just gave me a clue to something I need to know on something I'm working on. So <laughs> would you say that because of how close to death you were, you pay attention to things now that you didn't pay attention to before? Absolutely. Uh, I developed it because of that gift, I became sensitive to sounds around me, flash around me, touches um wind uh it was because of that that i picked up this this gift before that you know i thought i had something you know i always knew i was different um in the spirits and or you know the dark side if you would um but after i had this cancer and started seeing things different um i realized to tap in more to my senses uh, to pay attention more around me. I learned to start listening to people more. I wasn't a listener. Uh, in my marriage, I did not listen to my wife, won't lie. <laughs> if you ask her to this day what was wrong, he didn't listen. No, I was busy. I was always on the grind. But I learned to listen to people, but not listen to it as they mean it. Listen to it and then take it in and think about it because it could mean something different than what they're meaning. So, and as far as people criticize me again, I really don't let a lot of people know about that gift. Um, again, I haven't even talked about it to anybody since I've left Florida, which is in 2014, um, because I really haven't worked with anybody that had to change their life. I've been changing my life since then, but I see why I'm doing better in life is because I made changes in others. Um, people think that you don't get rewarded. And I'm like, it, it's not always money. I was making uh, $8.20 in Florida back in 2014. And to this day in Florida, you can't make nine dollars an hour. I mean, unless you you got a degree in something. Um, but you have to make moves in your life. I went to Michigan. I started growing marijuana for a few years. I learned how to do it professionally. And then from there, after I got done with, I worked with. Um, I don't know if you listen to Waka Flocka, but his blunt roller actually uh, gave me my first pound of marijuana to quit smoking cigarettes. Um, and he's a friend of mine to this day. Uh, he watches. He's a subscriber to my channel. 
But uh, through that, I picked up working 17, 18 hour days and it didn't really pay a lot. It didn't pay a lot. People think, oh, you make a fortune growing marijuana. No, you don't. <laughs> not when not when you're up at five in the morning and you're turning off the lights at 10 at night. It's not a lot. Right. But uh, and then I made moves after I learned that. I didn't just stick with that. It's once I learned to trade, I moved on to something else. Um, so that's why I'm doing YouTube these days. <laughs> yeah. So what are you moving on to now? What is your What's your next project that you're working on? Uh, I'm really looking forward to the Halloween one. That's going to be a crossover for me to do um, events. And this one here, you don't understand how much you helped me. Um, I was really looking to do interviews. I did one, but I knew the guy. I needed to do something with somebody I didn't know to take me out of my game. And when they told me you are a journalist, I, I jumped over. I was in a panic. I was like, you guys, I'm going to kill you, man. Why would you do that to me? They picked a professional for my first one. But I really do appreciate it again. And, man, this one has been cool. It's been a lot better than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. I was nervous. I'm not going to lie. I was nervous. <laughs> well, well, they told, nervous. I, I had heard references that your uh, channel is a lot like Oprah in your content. And, when, man, I was hearing this. These, they were psyching me out. <laughs> No, well, that's a very kind thing to say. I would not put myself near that level, but I do appreciate it. I think, um, you know, it's always good to support other creators. I think it's awesome when people can collaborate because I think we kind of live in a day and age where people are almost trying to compete all the time yeah. that you don't see many moments where people are just mutually, you know, sharing an experience or sharing each other's voices. So yeah, it's, it's my pleasure. How did you come up with a channel, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, yeah. I um, So, funny enough, as this quarantine began, I, so my, my school shut down and everything was shutting down um, at the very beginning. And I, so I'm in journalism school and I was just kind of getting these really cool experiences where I was going to a lot of events and talking to a lot of cool people. And then the world kind of shut down and I was like, all right, well, I really liked doing that. How can I keep doing that? And oh. so I downloaded and it, and it didn't start actually funny. I didn't start out with an idea for a channel. It started out with me before I, you know, before I questioned how I was going to keep doing interviews out of boredom, I just downloaded the TikTok app on my phone and everyone had already had it way before me. So I was late to the game, but I downloaded it anyways. And I started after you kind of, after you have it for a little bit, you get past all the kind of like trending stuff and you mm -hmm. start getting more stuff that's geared more toward, you know, whatever you're probably searching on your <laughs> phone that they're looking at. But um, so I started coming across some, um, and I didn't realize the algorithm worked that way. So when I would come across people sharing the crazy, like, you know, you only have such a short time. So they would share a super short video about like this crazy experience that, that happened to them. And then you would click on their video or their channel and you would see that they have like a part 15 of whatever their story was, like a 15 part of how did I, how did I, um, I don't know, how did I beat the stock market and, you know, win this or whatever. And you, some of the stories are like that, or some of them would be like, I, you know, had this really rare medical condition and like, and you, you get, in, you have such a short time to show that, that you get so intrigued and you want to know more. So the more I was liking this type of videos, the more I was getting them on my feed. And it crossed my mind that I could try to interview those people and I really didn't think anyone was going to answer me so I was kind of like a, I was like I wonder if I can't even remember who the very first person that I reached out to was I think I I think I started the channel by uploading a couple old videos that were not from TikTok and then I realized um I was like I wonder if I could this person would answer me and I wonder if we could interview each other like on zoom since that's how all my classes were going and everyone was doing zoom and I was like and you know they were in all different parts of the country so I just would reach out I would go into their account and usually they have this is at least how I do it because I found I think I very first tried to reach out on TikTok itself and I think it's so busy 
that mm-hmm. people don't check their messages on there. Yeah. So I wouldn't, I would try to usually in their little bios, they'll have like their Instagram or their other, or their website, if they have one or um, other social medias. So I would reach out to them on other social medias and just say, you know, this is me, you know, I'm, I'm a journalism student and I saw this TikTok that you made. It was really interesting. Would you want to do an interview? I just started a channel and all this stuff. And I would say, and it's still, I still would, I still to this day reach out to a lot of people and maybe get 50% response, which is fine. You're doing better than me. But <laughs> You're doing way better than me. So, <laughs> but it's like, um, I was really, really excited that people were agreeing. Anyone was agreeing. I was like, oh my gosh, they want to talk to me. That's so awesome. I didn't think yeah. anyone would. So um, it kind of started that way. And I've, I've continued to reach out that way. And, you know, some people will say, oh, I don't think so. Some people will say no. Some people just won't answer. Um, but plenty of people are happy to talk about their stories. And I think it's really awesome to have the um technology that we have to so easily talk to someone and put it out there so quickly because you know I was I was kind of and it's it's there's pros and cons on the journalism side because I was in a phase of my learning where it was going out and shooting and talking to the people in person and you I wasn't on it I was just I was asking them questions but you couldn't see me yeah. and which I kind of like better, but um, <laughs> you couldn't see me and, you know, you would have a, par- a partner with you that would help you um, shoot while you were asking them questions or stuff like that. And then you would go back to the um, lab and you'd have to spend however long editing it. And usually, and usually, you know, since they were for assignments, there was a longer period of time that you had to edit all your stuff exactly the way you wanted it to look and kind of put a pack, a whole news package together. And it looked really nice and it looked professional. And it was um, usually, even though you sh- went out and shot a lot, your video en- only ended up being like two minutes long for yeah. like a whole day of shooting. And so I was kind of getting used to that format. And so this has been a really good way to get this stuff out right away. Like I, you're, I'm literally just, I screen record it and then I put the whole thing there, whether that's I would say, depending on how long I talk, that can be good or bad for the audience because people don't usually want to listen that long. But I kind of went transitioned from very much formatting and editing a package of news to let me do an interview. I'm not going to edit any of it. It's going to go where it's going to go. And then it's going to go out there and people can listen to it if they want to. So that's kind of where it went for me. Yeah, you do have some amazing content. are, Are you on the 40 minute time limit on this? I don't think so. Nothing's okay. coming up. Okay. I just want to make sure. Um, Cause I did have a couple more questions for you. Yeah, sure. I do want to ask you something. One, I didn't email you, but do you have anybody on YouTube that you do watch? Who's, who's your people that you watch on YouTube? Um, You know, I follow a lot of, like, I, I'll, I'll keep up with like the Jimmy Fallon videos and the Jimmy Kimmel videos. Okay. I'm not a huge YouTube watcher. It's, it's funny. Cause I post a lot in there, but I don't, sit there and watch it all um you know I mainly go on there for I'll go on there I usually use it as just like an entertainment like a comic relief type of thing so most of the stuff I look at isn't super serious yeah um so yeah I I follow uh you know different makeup artists different you know cooking channels stuff like that so I'm not you don't watch Bailey (laughs) okay (laughs) all right everybody watches Bailey (laughs) no no, I'm not, um, I'm not super into it, but, um, you know, always new stuff to find. So I didn't email you this question. If you don't want to answer it, don't, uh, you don't have to, but was there ever an interview you did that you didn't release? Cause it just made you uncomfortable or you just, um, no, it's, the, only happy with time, everyone. the only time. And it, it, I didn't delete it, but I, and I still kick myself for it so hard. And it was a really good interview and it meant a lot to me. And it just didn't record. Like I, after it finished, I realized that it didn't record at all. So, there, it, oh. so we did all this talking, and it was. So I keep looking up here at the top of my screen, making. Sure I just realized talking. I wasn't recording. I will need a copy of this if you yes, don't mind. Yes. Yeah, so I still saying that I am. So I, I still get paranoid about that. But no, I don't. I've never scrapped anything. What's your favorite aspect of what you do? 
Um, I really love learning people's stories that are different than mine because I don't get a lot of value personally. And even with my friendships, talking a lot with people that are exactly like me, because it doesn't really go anywhere. Uh But when I get to talk to people and they have totally different experience, a totally different viewpoint on issues, um, it's a good opportunity to get perspective on life and think about things maybe differently than you did going into it. And I think, I hope that by sharing those conversations, other people might be able to do the same thing. Yeah. I do. Uh, I only have one more question for you. Um, what was your favorite interview? What was your favorite? Uh, one? Well, I really, I have a special place for all of them. I think it's, I really, I do respect anyone who is willing to talk to me, especially if it's something sensitive, because I know that that's hard. It's hard um, to do interviews. <laughs> yeah, there was one, there's still one that is just very special to me. Um, and recently I reposted it uh, the other day because it was the anniversary of 9-11. There was, I, and it was one of my, it's funny because it was one of my first ones, um, one of my very early videos that I found on TikTok. Um, this woman who survived 9-11 and was in the North Tower and made it out and shared with me the details of how her day went that day from, you know, the people she interacted with and how she felt and what she was being told by officers and, you know, what her surroundings looked like, kind of like you pick up on your surroundings. She was able to really describe, especially if it's something difficult, you're just more aware of everything. You remember everything more. So she recounted, she would, I was very thankful that she was willing to talk about it. Um, I figured she was willing to talk about it because she put it on TikTok. That's another thing about the interviews. If you're putting it out online, you're probably going to want to talk about it anyway, or else you wouldn't have put it online. Yeah. So it's kind of easier than if I'm in person with someone saying, hey, would you mind doing an interview with me? The likelihood that they're going to say no is a lot higher because they're not like, you know, they're not talking about themselves already. So um, I was very grateful that she wanted to really dig deeper into it. Um, And the reason that that one is really special is because a lot of people responded to it in the comments, sharing their own experiences. And it's one of those subjects where no matter who you are or what you believe, everyone has a memory of that time. So to hear all of those stories from people meant so much to me that that many people could connect to her. I looked at your videos. I know I said I had that was the last question. But I got yeah, one more. Fine. I looked through your videos and I didn't see it. Have you ever thought about doing a follow up with any of your uh, guests? Um, I would. I would consider that. I, I hadn't. I haven't done that yet. But that would be interesting. I actually did follow up with mine. They did better than the originals. Just so you know. <laughs> so, but I mean, not guests, but on my topic. So I don't know how it will work with interviews, but oh, I wasn't you mean sure. like you mean. Like I went back to Graves when I found out more information on the the um, subject after I thought I was done with it and went back and it seemed like part two of it would do better. Also, yeah. I want to let you know on that part two, there is a reason people do that. Um, and if you ever watch YouTube videos, it's to make people keep coming back. Right. They do it for that. Oh, so you already know. Yeah, no, I, I, I get it. it. It keeps me coming back. Yeah, I think it's, I also want to make sure, you know, I have noticed because I wouldn't, I wouldn't call these follow-ups, but I've noticed with certain subject matters, like for example, any, um, and this is another thing that means a lot to me, is any sort of um, mental health issue or drug issues usually, or addiction issues. Those people I found just on on these interviews and just meeting them in person, especially if they're recovering, really like to talk about it and yeah. really like to bring awareness to it. So those are that's a population of people that I think are very willing to share versus, and it would be a very easy follow-up. And I've connected with a lot of people where, and it's, it, I, would, I would say the same for domestic violence survivors too. They, they really like to share. And I think that's wonderful. But you have to... I, I try to keep my content varied. So, you know, it's, and that, and, and I would be interested actually to hear your advice on this because your content is very concentrated. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's very thematic. It's, it, you know what I mean? Is Mine there? kind of isn't. 
So what do you think the benefits are of keeping the same theme? I've heard both. Now I talked to um, Harmon from Inf Infamous Crime Scenes. Uh, he does pretty well. I actually have an issue with him right now because he kind of burned me on a deal. But <laughs> I talked to him and his numbers are dropping right now. He, he was normally getting around 18,000 views a day. I just looked at his recent views and he's getting about 11,000 a week. And I told him, man, you got to change. Believe me, I don't know about YouTube, but I have worked in promotion uh, and I have worked in radio. I know if you stick to the same thing, people are not going to watch it all the time, especially when you're following uh, Lamont and I'm following you and we're all following each other covering the same grades. We're just telling a story a little different. Um, I can go both ways. I'm doing really well right now. My numbers are skyrocketing while I'm watching his fall. And his advice to me was stick to one thing. He tried to um, try doing more than one. It didn't work for him. But I looked at his content, what he was covering before, and it was almost in the same genre. He was covering abandoned places. Now he's covering cemeteries. So it, it didn't really change a lot. He's still kind of in that same niche, if you will. Um, so I'm doing well with it. When I bounce from like the car shows and I do the karate, my karate one um, went from zero views to 15,000 views in, in just over two and a half weeks. And because of that, now I'm invited back to do all kinds of seminars and stuff at like that karate. They didn't think I got more views on that one video than that school has on all their videos combined. And they've been posting videos for eight years. So wow. I do well. I think it, it depends on how you present it. You present stuff amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I'm baffled why your your views are so little. But then I talk to you and I get it. I spent a fortune advertising. That's why my views are high. <laughs> uh, I was paying Google, Google between four and seven hundred dollars a month. And that's why I say I lost a lot of viewers right. um, because of my content. But I pay for that. I make good money. And that's this is my hobby. That's what I spend it on. Um, but I was shocked to see you didn't have views. But then when you told me you didn't advertise, I'm like, that's a big part of it. Because if your channel was out there, you would you blow mine away. I seen you pull in 800 something subscribers in two weeks. And I was originally doing this interview to promote your channel. I'm like, by the time I'm done, I'm going to need her to promote me. <laughs> no, but your content is amazing. Um, I was just yeah. shocked that you're not getting the views. But now I understand why. And it is expensive to get your channel out there. People don't understand. Um, they don't understand how expensive it is. You could be the best content creator there is. If you're not paying an advertiser, Google's not doing it for you for free. They won't. So your word just don't get out. And that's one of the reasons why, one of the things I'm trying to uh, do content creators, now that I made it past that thousand, I pay my advertising. I'm like, well, since I pay my advertising anyways, I can go ahead and advertise for other people if they're willing to talk to me in an interview. So it's a fair trade. So in return, hopefully, I hope I get you some subscribes, but you don't look like you need me. I was like, damn, 800 subs, man. Jesus. Oh, well, I was I, watching that every day. and I, I got nervous. I was like, man, at the end of the day, this girl's going to make me look autistic. No, no, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not. I, I think the average, yes, I do agree. Advertising is very important. I think aside from putting my content on my social medias and promoting it that way. Mm -hmm. I, I do. And that, and it, it is, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to just, I, you don't want to get caught in the trap of paying for robots to watch your videos. Yes, you're right. Yeah. And that's why I don't want to say too much because there's people that don't know the backside of YouTube, but that's why I wanted to warn you. I was like, if you went that one route that we had talked about, you better get used to it every day. Yeah. Uh, because I talked to people, I actually worked a case on that I haven't released yet with Fiverr. We received death threats on it. Uh, pictures of, it was weird because it took a picture from a video. Now I'm very self-conscious. We actually have security when we go out to locations because of the content we do a lot of times they're unsolved crimes and there's people in this area that are still out there on the streets mm -hmm. um with that said we had somebody send a picture once of my daughter's mother's car now i'm not even with her but uh i used her car that day because she needed mine to take my daughter to the karate and hers wasn't cleaned out so i used her car and normally i'm subconscious about it but she was selling the car anyway so i didn't worry about keeping the camera off it this person when i was investigating it was actually Fiverr. Uh, it involved Fiverr and a couple other big companies. Uh, when I was looking into it, they sent me pictures, kept sending me messages, check your Facebook, check your Facebook. And when I looked, there was pictures of my daughter's motor's car. And I'm laughing, I'm like, 
I put that out there. We have security that looks over this video before it gets released all the time to make sure there's nothing revealing. Because we have members that don't want to be revealed. They have jobs and stuff. They don't want to be out there. Uh, but we have received threats, and we're currently receiving threats from another case that's unsolved from a missing woman here in Colorado. We've received threats. We've um, everything from lawsuits to pulling down the video, or our people will come get you, just all kinds of stuff. We hit on some touchy subjects. Uh, the one, uh, the Terry, um, I believe her, uh, I forget her last name, but she's missing right now. She just passed the anniversary of her missing date like last week. And I've been in contact with the family, but we're getting all kinds of uh, threats that we have had to turn over to authorities, actually from out of state, from in New Jersey, uh, martial arts schools, from other uh, that this guy was involved with um, that we suspected and we released information. So it's a dangerous game and it does cost a lot of money. Um, I would stay where you're at as far as content. You're doing well. And if you're not receiving threats um, and people are liking your stuff, you're right where you need to be. You're doing amazing with it. Um, why? Are you looking to do something else? Um, no, I was just curious. I think, you know, it's hard to just in my career of it's also hard. It's, it's hard because I can't. I, I don't want you paint that I have a, some type of affiliation you know what I mean or I'm too pushy on one certain topic because I think that makes me that's going to make me seem biased for reporting on anything else so I, I really do make an effort regardless of my beliefs to stay out of it and not promote any you know what I mean not yeah. like promote things so I just wondered, and, and even in, in my world of journalism, people say you shouldn't focus on something because you're not focused enough on one thing. You're, you're too, you have too many different things that, you know what I mean? You're not, it, you, your name isn't directly associated with one thing. So that can be hard to build a brand based off of that, I guess. Yeah, you pick some good topics. I would stay right where you're at. If you're doing well, especially if people are giving you interviews. Um, I'm having trouble. I had my first one with somebody I knew for years, a recovering drug addict, and they're always willing to talk, like you said. Mm -hmm. Especially he was uh, a religious person, so he wanted to promote his Jesus. I'm like, uh, if that's what it takes to get your interview, go ahead and promote your religion. I have people from Russia and Pakistan that subscribe. I got people from actually other countries because of the content I do. And I'm like, I really don't want to promote any one religion because I know I have Muslims that watch this uh, for sure. They've commented on my stuff about uh, religious topics. So I try not to stick with any one religion. That's why I usually don't even bring up my uh, satanic beliefs. So. Mm -hmm. But you stick where you're at. You're doing amazing. Well, I do you. have to cut this one uh, short here. I do have to go get my daughter. <laughs> you're good. You're good. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> no, thank you for having me. And um, if you don't mind, I will need a copy of this. If you're going to do yeah. it uh, in its entirety, though, I can actually screen copy it as, as long as I got your permission. Oh, sure. That's fine. Okay. I just don't want to take anybody's content without permission. No, that's okay. You can copy whatever you need. If you need, if you need me to send you it, I can do that as well. All right. Um, also, if you ever need a good recovering drug addict, I do have somebody, I'll give you a name off screen if you ever need an interview and you're running short on content. I know somebody that would be perfect for your show. All right, awesome. Thank you so much. It was great to meet you. Hey, you too. You stay cool. All right, have a good one. You too, bye-bye.